right? <laughs> that works pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> it's always strange hearing your own voice. Yeah. It sounds so different than what you think. It yeah, sounds. it does sound different yeah. than what you think in your head. There's like, okay, this is off topic, but um, like there's those rooms where you, there's like no um, bouncing back of like audio uh, oh. and you can't hear yourself. And oh. apparently it's like the freakiest thing. Because <laughs> like apparently hearing yourself is like a super important part of being able to tell like how loud you are. Or oh, yes. Like that, right? yes. Um, okay, so we'll start with just... Maybe your position at the sure. Cancer Center, so what your job is? So um, I'm a professor at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, and my um, area, I'm in the epidemiology mm -hmm. program, and I'm a biostatistician by training, and I also am the director of the Biostatistics Shared Resource for the Cancer Center. Okay. And I just recently became the associate director for shared resources to manage all the shared resources. Okay. And some of your previous work involves um, outside of Hawaii, right, projects. So you've worked previously in... So I, um, before I came to Hawaii, which was in 1988, uh -huh. I worked in reproductive health. So I, okay. Um, when I was a graduate student, I worked in heart disease, and then I worked in reproductive health. And then mm -hmm. when I came to Hawaii, I worked at the cancer center. I've been in cancer ever since. Mm, I see. Yeah. What was one of the projects that you worked on, perhaps, that standed out as, like, communicating with your patients? Have you ever had to communicate with your, perhaps, consumers in this case? I guess not really consumers, but people that were affected by your research. So, um... Russia. That's a weird yeah. question to ask to start off with, but um, no, it's not a weird question. It's just um, there's lots of stakeholders. So one of the stakeholders uh -huh. is other researchers, right? Clinicians, and okay. then the people we are collecting data. We're from. actually collecting data. So I can give you. Um, I'll tell you about a big project we work on, which I think you alluded mm -hmm. to earlier. But um, one little project I worked on. Um, which was outside my outside of cancer, but an ophthalmologist in Hawaii wanted to do a test. I wanted to do a study to see if lidocaine was needed for um, pain management of uh, lidocaine. You said, yeah. Okay. Um, they used to give it to uh, when you were doing cataract surgery. Mm -hmm. They would give you topical um, anesthesia, and they'd give you lidocaine. Okay. For pain in your eye. Mm -hmm. And, but one out of, I think it was one out of a thousand or one out of 10,000. Mm -hmm. One out of 10,000 people would go blind. Oh, no. Medicaid. Okay. Very severe. Yes. So he, does, he didn't think it was necessary. So he did a study where he got people to agree they were going to have both eyes done. Uh-huh. To randomize one eye to lidocaine and one eye to not lidocaine. Oh, okay. Just placebo drops. Mm -hmm. And we randomly orient, you know, um, randomly uh, ordered whether which eye. Okay. And I don't remember the sample size. I can look it up. But interestingly, mm -hmm. the people who had no lidocaine in the first eye, they rated their pain level as less than medium you know okay. kind of not nothing but you right. know, tolerable mm -hmm. and the people who had lidocaine rated their uh, first rated their pain as nothing okay and then they when they switched over the people who had no lidocaine and got the lidocaine they, they also did, you know felt no pain but the people who had lidocaine and went to no lidocaine felt a lot of pain because they had expectations for what it would feel like mm. and then it was more painful but the people who had lidocaine first they did fine as long so as you it was told an expect ex expectations i see yeah. so anyway that study that was one of the first studies um, of this and there was one other study in the and because of those two studies they stopped the use of lidocaine. Oh, really? Yeah. Completely? Yeah, they don't use it in um, cataract surgery because one in 10,000 going blind is such it's a pretty severe. Bad. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty bad. So, you know, the fact that they were having mild pain. You yeah. Know? Okay. Yeah. So that, so the, who's the consumer there? In some ways, it's the people who were getting cataract surgery, but it's really the 
ophthalmologists. The people that are going to be applying it. Right. Okay. So that's a little study, so it had kind of right. more immediate effect than most of our studies. But uh, Right. So you actually got to see your research and data be put into effect. Very quickly, yes. Very quickly. Yeah. Okay. That was That's the unusual thing. Do you know how long you worked on that project for? Yeah, I was, uh, it was like a year. Oh, that's it not was too very, bad, it was very, Yeah, so he, you know, he runs his own practice. And um, he, this idea of a physician, um, and he just called me out of the blue, you know, looking for someone to help him with the statistics. Um, mm -hmm. And I mostly don't do, um, I mostly don't do consulting because I'm, I'm so busy. But he yeah. was, he was um, really begging <laughs> so I, I gave in <laughs> i see and um anyway but it was an interesting thing i think it was an important study mm -hmm. most of the studies we do are really long-term studies so right um, so usually yeah more so, than a year right right so we had this big study called the multi-ethnic cohort study that right this is the started, one i heard of yeah mm -hmm. started in 1993 and we um I was involved at the very beginning, and we sent out these questionnaires to people that we presumed to be um, of five ethnic groups, uh, Hawaiians, Japanese, whites, African American and Latino okay. in Hawaii and California, right. Hawaii and Los Angeles. And uh, we got the driver's license, and we, we presumed a race based on their um, name. Okay. You know. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but then we asked them in the okay. share. Um, yeah. Anyway, 215,000 people. You That's know, got, a lot, yeah. Uh, it took us three years to do that, to get okay. them in. Okay, three years to do that. And then yeah. we follow them. We're very lucky in that Hawaii and California have Very state, diverse. They're very diverse, and they have statewide cancer registries. Okay. So any cancer that is uh, I diagnosed in either of those states gets put into the registry, so, and then you can... For research, they let you link to it. Oh, okay. So we know who has cancer without having to ask them. Okay. We do follow them, you know, and ask mm -hmm. them questions about other things, other conditions. Right. And, but, um, and smoking and, you know, drinking and diet. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm trying to think, um, we, we're now in 20, it's 25 years of follow up. And some of the things we found are probably one of the more interesting things we found is that um, among smokers, um, if you smoke a little bit, no matter which ethnic group you come from, mm -hmm. you have a low risk. I mean, a rel not as low as non-smokers, but right. a low risk. If you smoke a lot of cigarettes, two packs or more a day, no matter mm -hmm. who you are, your risk is high of lung cancer. If you smoke a medium amount of cigarettes, yeah. If you are Japanese or Latino, your risk is much lower of getting lung cancer. Oh, really? Than whites. And if you're African American or Hawaiian, your risk is much higher. Hmm. It really changes your risk. Um, and this was based on the 215,000 mm -hmm. applicants that you guys got? Right. So we asked that. them, you know, they're smoking, and then okay. we follow them for lung cancer. And that f f you guys followed them for how long? So far, you, right is now, it still it's, ongoing? It's still this ongoing. project is still ongoing, mm -hmm. and you're still a part of it. Yeah. Okay. And that first, the first time we saw it was probably ten years out. We mm -hmm. looked at it, and then we just repeated it uh, twenty years out, and it's still the same. And so it's like reinforcing mm -hmm. your your Our first your previous. Project. Okay. And now there's a big project. Um, to find out why. <laughs> right. And um, we we pretty much understand. I mean, you, you never know if you understand it completely, but right. the Japanese have a, um, a genetic, um, there's something called SIP, these genes called SIP, 1A2, 1A6 is the one that um, huh. activates carcinogens in the, scan, in the smoke, um, okay. ac activates toxins, actually. Okay. And the Japanese are more likely to have the allele that does not activate. Ooh, okay. Which for smoking is very good. For there's certain kinds of chemo that don't work as well. In oh, because I see. Because they don't activate the toxin. Right. The chemo. Okay. So, you know, your genetics. I mean, all of us are living. 
Right. So they're not they're not fatal um, alleles, but it just changes your risk of some things for the better and some things for the worse. Okay. But for smokers, they have a lower risk. We do not know why Latinos have a lower risk. We still hmm. don't understand that. Um, the African Americans, we they actually have a gen, um, one of the SIPs. They can't. They don't um, metabolize the nicotine as uh, efficiently, so they are smoking probably deeper to get more. Oh, nicotine. I see. So then they're the pulling same effects, more yeah, of the carcinogens okay. in. So that's why we think they're getting mm. more. The Hawaiians, we're not still, we're still not sure. Um, there's so many things, you know. Um, Small. Things, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So many things that they're exposed. You know, Hawaiians, they have clean air, clean right. water. Right, they're very used to it. Uh, but, you know, they they do tend to be heavy from mm -hmm. early yeah, on in definitely. life. And so that can have an effect on okay. lots of things. Smoking, I, I just don't know. Um, anyway, we don't understand All the Latinos it, yeah. yet. or We're still studying those. <laughs> and so is your job more to work on gathering the data, analyzing the data, or is it like a whole thing that... So I'm very involved in the design. Okay. Um, because... Um, so uh, so I'm design involved in the design. I'm also working on a childhood obesity study, and mm -hmm. it's kind of the same, help create the design. Okay. And then work on making sure the instruments are measuring what they're supposed to measure and you know, review those and or do a calibration mm -hmm. study to figure out if it really is measuring what it's supposed to and then the data management how to get the data in how to check it the okay. quality and then the data analysis mm. so i'm involved so in throughout the ways. entire process at each step basically you're so, at least a little bit involved right right okay and um so and actually a lot uh, if you the interesting thing is if you do a lot of the work make sure that all your pro you know your instruments and your design is good okay and everybody is well trained mm-hmm if you're lucky, some studies kind of go on cruise control. You know that every it just everybody works. knows. Yeah, yeah, it just works. And then the data comes in, and it's still not. I mean, there's always challenges with right data with the in. data because that you don't really know what you'll get. Right, but if you set it up well, you likely get better data. Right, you. Okay. And then the analysis actually, you know, is very important, but actually takes. You know, is actually a small part of these studies, these epi studies. Um, I think if you do these little clinical studies, you know, they're much like the one I told you, they're much more contracted and the analysis is probably half. Mm -hmm. But in these big epi studies, the analysis is probably a fifth of the work. Oh, so yeah, there's much less than you might expect. Right. But all along, those things help with the, well, if you don't do those good things, Story. Your analysis is going to take more time. Yeah. Right. And, they, then and be more data difficult that, yeah. to understand what it means. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's all, of, it's, uh, I kind of, it's not a good analogy. I can't think of a better one, though, but I think of research like loading a gun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a gun person, so I have to think of a better analogy. But if you do it, if you set everything up right, uh -huh. then when you execute, it should. It should be far forward. Yeah, exactly. It, you You'll know, be more likely to hit the target. Yes. Right? Yes. So, so a professional will have yeah. an easier time with a better gun. Right. Okay. So I, you know, research we think of as, you know, and there there is a lot of work at the end with the data. Right. But I think people don't realize how just much to, of it, it is, comes yeah. from the yeah. And if the, the data goes data analysis goes smoothly. Like a lot of that is actually due to the steps before it, right? Yes, yes. In fact, um, this uh, childhood obesity study I worked on, we did an intervention um, of childhood obesity in the Pacific, which was actually successful. It was more of an en environmental, like a change in policy, improving parks, you know, mm -hmm. um, working with stores to get better food in, that kind of thing. And um, But I spent, I was only 10% on the grant. And I spent 50% of my time in the first year on that grant because someone asked me, well, why are you spending so much time when you're not? And I said, you know, if I set it, if I set it, if we set it up right, 
I won't need 10% later on. Mm. And it, it's, it's, it's amazing how it works, but you know, you really need to be involved at the beginning because you don't want right. surprises. You, you don't want to show up and there's like a bad foundation and all of a sudden you need to change everything. Right. right. And the, one of the worst, ex, I mean, worst experiences I yeah. had with this is uh, when I worked in reproductive health a woman was doing a study of these mothers in Africa mm -hmm. and she came to me and she wanted help with the analysis and it was supposed to be a longitudinal study that she did not keep track of like, that this is the same woman oh no they had different IDs and she didn't have the identifiers so then all that work is well it's... she was able to go back right and but she had to spend like four months oh you know, wow yeah I'm sure she was able to recover, but you know you, you don't you wouldn't have had to do that, right? And the frustration and the yeah, yeah no, I mean the first thing you do is well if it's going to be longitudinal, you have to have a way of linking them through time, mm -hmm. yeah. Or you have to you know if you have someone who's done it enough, they'll know they'll already yeah. know what they need. This these are the central things. These you are have the to, inputs that right, right. you need to get this output. Okay, right. but if you I think that, you know, um, if you're, so I'm not a field person, not that I haven't ever been to, you know, out with the, in the field, mm -hmm. but I don't do measurement and I don't, and that's actually by design. You don't want the person who's analyzing it to be measuring. Okay. Cause I might be biased mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. I might be biased. But the people who are in the field, they have to have rapport with the people and they have to have good data they have to it's a really hard task yeah it's... so they're not necessarily going to notice things that are going to lead to problems later on i see so you need a good relationship between each right. each of the groups right, right. each of the right. steps right. Okay. yeah so um how have we so we've communicated that smoking finding through um you know, peer reviewed to our colleagues, to our other mm -hmm. researchers, but that's a hard, that's a hard thing to tell. I mean, we have told in newsletters to our people who are in our study, but that's a hard thing to tell people. I mean, it's clearly if you're African American yeah. or Hawaiian, yeah. you have ever, even more reason not to smoke. Right. But we don't want to send the message that if you're Japanese or, or Latino, oh, yeah. please go, go ahead and smoke. <laughs> you guys are fine. Yeah. Most of the time, I yeah. think. <laughs> and there's so many cancers that smoking is related to that you wouldn't even think. Breast cancer, colorectal cancer, not to the extent of lung cancer and mouth cancer, but so you just heart disease. So you don't want to send that's a tricky message to send. It's so much yes. easier to send, don't just, don't do just something. Don't do yeah. something right, yeah. but you don't want to be right. lying at the same time, right? Um, how big were these groups? Like, how big was, like, the group that was working on these studies? Mm. Like, the researchers and the people gathering the data behind it? Would you so, say around, I don't need, yeah. like, a number, or I guess, you know, in general. So we have a group at USC, and we have a group at, in Hawaii. In Hawaii, okay. And the staff, I'm going to say we have 15, 20 staff in Hawaii, and they probably have 10 in L.A. Because we do, we, we're the, we do most of the man, data management, so we have and that's. Our side. So around 50 people, you'd say? Yeah, with the investigators, then you're talking about 50, okay. 75 people, which so is actually it's, pretty It's small actually pretty group. small, if I think about it. Yeah. It's pretty small. Where if you did a clinical study, I think you'd have to have more. But okay. we're doing so much offline, mm -hmm. so calling More, them, okay. and yeah. but we don't bring them in all the time, and or rarely even. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's mostly done offline. The fact that we can link to a registry rather than looking up medical records. Right, yeah. That just helps. is so much more Yeah, that efficient. helps a lot. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. what about like maybe the funding behind it? Um, um, is it well-funded? Is it a well-funded project? Or so, are you guys having to keep looking? For... Oh, we all, always on the lookout for more okay. money. <laughs> That's the nature of that. Yeah. But um, it's been funded continuously from NI, NCI, uh, National Cancer Institute. And um, I mean, I, I think they have been... 
they've been as generous with us as as probably anybody um mm -hmm. but the do uh, research dollars are in the old days the studies were smaller and what money you told them what a budget your budget was and mm -hmm. then you would either get it or not get it but right. now if they fund you they cut you 25 percent. oh really because they what's happened is research has gotten to be so much more expensive mm -hmm. so there's a lot more biological measures that we're doing you know genetics or biomarkers you want less and less error and yeah and measures. they are expensive and that gets really expensive yeah. as opposed to sending a questionnaire right yeah, so, right um so in some ways I and mean, you'll hear people talk you know we have all these omics to measure and so in some ways it's the golden era Mm -hmm. And in other ways, it's like it's, yeah, it's true. yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's hard. It's, so um, it's very competitive. It's very competitive, and they always are going to cut your funding. Okay. Um, so it's challenging, and I think, and the other challenge is that um, you know universities are not paying what some places like Google. Oh yeah. Pay and Private, so um, yeah. people who get a you know a PhD in bios or epi, they actually poach them in California. Our colleagues yeah. at USC, the po the postdocs, have been called, you know, just called out of the blue. Huh. Yeah, because they're looking for people. Mm. And they say we can triple your salary. And it's hard to say no, right? So. Well, they, a lot of them say no for a long time, and then they, they can't get funding for their grants, or it's really difficult, oh, and then they get mm. discouraged. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's tough, and I don't know where... So, academia right now might be in a tough spot. Did you it's say, very like, much competitively? So. Very much so. And, and not, just in, not just in these competitive fields, but um, traditionally... Um, Universities were filled with by the baby boomers, mm. and they are in mass walking out the door, retiring. Right. Now. So, getting new people in, the you know, and it's tough. Yeah. Okay. So, I think it's, I see. Yeah. Um, I have a few questions, perhaps. Okay. Has the government ever had any impact, whether it be like state or? Mm. Country-wise, on your projects, have they impacted the way you've had to conduct your research? So very much so. In when I worked in reproductive health, okay, yeah, um, probably. Reagan, we, you know, Reagan cut a lot of those programs when mm -hmm. he was president, so the money was less. Um, we <clears throat> we worked with USAID. We got our money uh, at that time from USAID, mm -hmm. and there were certain. So I started life as a demographer and more in demography. What is demography? Pop, um, population oh, okay. trends. Yes. Cool. Um, so, um, and I worked at a place that worked in population, and we worked in other countries. Mm -hmm. We got money from USAID. And um, they gave us money, and we, there were countries we could work in, and there were countries we could not work in. Because mm -hmm. we either had a relationship with them or we didn't, a political okay. relationship. So um, I think we did good work where we were. Where you However, yeah. India and China were the, this is the 80s, and they had huge population uh, control problems. Mm -hmm. We couldn't work in those countries. But those are places you, you that they had important things that you could gather from, right? Right, right. But you just... Couldn't. Because there was no political political relationship. relationship. Okay. We worked in Bangladesh and Pakistan, mm -hmm. and and because of that too, we couldn't work in India. You know mm, that that was, I see. Okay. We had to spend a lot of money in in Egypt, which at the time had no population control issues. Yeah. But they be but it was a way for the government to shuttle, shuttle money to that country who was a friend, an ally in the Middle East. Okay. Um, having said that, we had to be creative, but I think we did good stuff in Egypt. I, know, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we ever wasted the taxpayer money, but where we could do the most good was not necessarily where we could work. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so there were some missed opportunities due to right. perhaps government relationships. And then when the we United when China States. opened up, my my boss at the time was Chinese, and he, um, his family fled the mm -hmm. Mao Revolution. Um, so when they opened up China, he was asked to go and form a relationship and he was very yeah. initially was very reluctant because you know the, the thing he remembered about china was being his family being threatened mm. so he did go back and he had a really good relationship because the the people in china the the scientists were so hungry for you know information information and so um and we had a, a group from china come and visit us for uh -huh. a time and um and they were, you know, just like sponges. They were so happy mm -hmm. to be talking yeah. about science. And and then um, then something happened. I don't know what. I can't remember uh -huh. what. And we closed our relationships with China for a while. Wow. And we had just to go like that. back and f charge that to some other, like to private money. Huh. That was done with, with government money. And then we had to charge it back to private money and then the next year we were back working in china so <laughs> so it's definitely getting in the way sometimes right? yes yes so cancer on the other hand is is i'm not i mean you could call it apolitical but actually it's pro-political because so many of the people who make decisions in washington are likely to get cancer Affected, yeah. <laughs> yes <They're, laughs> yes yeah. and their families get cancer right so Cancer's they have yeah. they have more incentive and it doesn't and in have other a, countries as well right yes so it doesn't have the same infectious disease you know until the mm -hmm. gates foundation the u.s was spending no money on malaria research which is oh, a yeah. huge killer in the You're world right. yeah but it's not a big killer in the u.s mm -hmm. so um I think I personally think that's short sighted because you can what you can learn from malaria. Right, doesn't necessarily need to just be a cure to malaria, right? Right. And it can also be useful to combat infectious diseases that might arise right. here. I mean, okay. So I yeah. think it's kind of short sighted, but that's the way the funding has been. Mm. But um, now I think infectious disease is gonna have to be back on the table. Yeah. And um, so anyway, um, yeah, it's it's the funding's political. Um, the funding for the state, um, that's kind of political because if you your you know, your campus can be in or out of favor with the legislature, mm. and you can get bullied. You can get, yeah, kind of bullied out of money. <laughs> right, you can get cut. You can yeah. get um, you know. There's going to be a base, but the base can be can fluctuate yeah so there's politics probably in everything but yeah in research there's certainly politics okay yeah. um i have like maybe one or two more questions um with the right conditions would you maybe sell some of your data research to military or have you like it what if you knew does does the intention of how your research might be used affect how you might distribute it so um, by and large what we study we we share with everyone it's public maybe? share with everyone okay. because that's kind of who who we are right we tend not to study things that now having said that um, we have a big bi repository mm -hmm. of specimens and there we have been but the question has arisen. Um, some companies have wanted, not the military, but some companies have wanted to use our biorepository mm. to, um, because we have the multi ethnic component. Yeah. They want to be able to target. Oh, I see, like targeted marketing. Yeah. Marketing. And we have had a lot of discussions about it, and we have said no to most of them. Okay. Because we, 
But it we, has come up. It has come up. And we have, we, in some, and from now on, we are putting, the other thing is, um, there were, when we had a terrible director, there was push to sell our specials. Mm. Like sell them to, um, to a drug company. Oh, mm. um, sell them to Chinese government because yeah. they're a you know Asian the Asian specimens. right yeah. Um, so in our informed consents now we put they will never be sold. Okay. Um, so now you guys have like a sort of guideline. Yeah. But at one point we didn't maybe think we due had to, to money. Say it. Yes. Yeah, due um, to money issues, it might have been you might have had to right right. To continue researching, yeah, but ethically, um, this research has been funded by taxpayers, mm -hmm. and so it should always be used for, for the common good. Yeah, for the common people. Okay. Right. It shouldn't be used to. But I will say there are people who. I, I mean, there's people. Look at the genome project. The guy walked out and formed a company, and this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, People who, are, you know, um, there's a drug discovery group, and the problem is that the university is never going to be able to develop a full drug line. So you mm. must sell that to drug companies. Yeah. So there's lots of gray area, you but the one, yeah. area that we work in is not that, or we can stay out of if we want to, can stay out of the ethical morass, and we want to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see. Yeah. So okay. um, there are things you can do with the data that would be just gray ethics. Mm -hmm. We just don't go there. Don't go there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it has been discussed. And okay. we don't want to, if, if a company like a biotech company could do something. Like really good with it? Really good with mm -hmm. it. You don't want to. This is the you dilemma. Don't want, yeah, you don't want you, to. Because you don't want to give it for something that might end up badly. But right. there's also the possibility that it could do great right. good, right? Right, yeah. That's so that's the, that's the dilemma. And mm -hmm. so you don't. And a lot of it boils down to trust. Mm -hmm. And so, if I if you know the people, yeah, if you have connections, and I guess. you know what their real intent is, then you're more like. But even then, personnel can change. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and you can write agreements like it's only for the use for of this, this amount of time or for this. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. But that's a good question. Yeah. And I I think that drug a lot of my colleagues went into drug companies. Mm -hmm. I think that's a real that's. That's really tough because they will invest maybe a billion dollars in a drug, and mm -hmm. then you are responsible for analyzing yeah, and then writing you have the to report. Make sure that billion dollars gets used. In the so proper. i i don't I don't think most people would purposely, but it it has to mm -hmm. slant your opinion. Yeah, right. It's not just your job; it's the whole company, the your whole all and your the people colleagues. that will be affected. As right? Well. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that concludes the interview. <laughs> um, I got basically everything I wanted from it. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs>